that's the good news. That... Jetzt, wie, unsere, ich sag mal, Dauergäste oder also die regelmäßigen Besucher unserer Konferenz, die kennen ja fast schon dieses Duo. Nein, die kennen das, nicht nur fast, die kennen das. Die, meistens haben wir auf unseren Konferenzen das Gespann Professor Nir Shaviv und Professor Hendrik Svensmark, die aus gutem Grund, wie Sie auch gleich sehen, im Päckchen auftreten. Aber zuerst möchte ich vorstellen den ersten Referenten, Professor Dr. Nir Sharif. Er ist ein israelisch-amerikanischer Physiker, der am Rucker Institute for Physics der Hebrew University Jerusalem lehrt. Nir Shaviv schloss 1990 am Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa seinen BA als Jahrgangsbester ab. 1994 erlangte er den Master of Science in Physik und 1996 seine Promotion. Innerhalb der Astrophysik wurde er besonders durch seine Arbeiten zur Eddington-Grenze bekannt und er zeigte, dass astrophysikalische Objekte heller erscheinen können, als die Eddington-Grenze vorgibt. Er konnte daher den Masseverlust bei Eta Carinae und Supernovae besser deuten. Seine Arbeiten über den möglichen Zusammenhang zwischen kosmischer Strahlung und dem Klima sowie den Spiralarmen der Milchstraße und den Eiszeiten sind auf große Resonanz in der wissenschaftlichen Literatur und auch in den allgemeinen Medien bekannt. Nir Shaviv, Nir, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure being here today. I'm very happy that um, a, this venue was uh, found after it was uh, changed. Otherwise, I would have uh, found myself uh, roaming uh, Munich for two days, and all I had to do was uh, drink beer. So I'm happy the conference is actually taking place. Um, I'm going to, whoa, this looks a little bit strange. Uh, I'm going to talk about, why does it look this way? Is there a, uh, This is better? Nope. I have no idea. This is very strange. So, während, während Professor Shaviv hier noch mit der Technik, der Kommunikation, meine ich, zwischen den beiden Geräten, Ding, möchte ich nur noch zwei Sachen dazu ergänzen. Wir werden im Anschluss ja Professor Hendrik Svensmark auch sprechen. Und ähm, Just tell me when I have to shut up. And um, the interesting is that the the work that the two do, yeah, ultimately also in the scientific funding so unbeliebt is that the funding, the financial, the uh, financing of forschung will I say, eingestellt wird, but Professor Svensmark jetzt seit einiger Zeit keine Chance hatte, seine Forschung fortzuführen. Okay, near. Okay, excellent. So. Um, don't upgrade to the last uh, Apple uh, system. Anyway, um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to talk about uh, the role that the sun uh, is having on uh, climate change. Um, I think it's very important, and I want to discuss in particular why it affects the way we understand uh, climate change over the 20th century. Um, so what I'll go on is uh, first of all, let's uh, start with a standard picture of uh, global warming. We have to understand what uh, people are saying in order to understand uh, what's wrong with it. Um, and then I'll show you evidence that uh, the sun has a large effect on climate. 
um, and uh, that we can quantify it, we can understand how much the sun is affecting the climate, and we'll see that it's much more than just uh, changes in the uh, total sol solar irradiance. There must be another mechanism which is affecting the climate, um, and uh, that is, of course, the effect that uh, cosmic rays have. And uh, this I will leave for uh, Henrik, who will talk after me over there. Uh, he will talk after me and uh, describe the evidence uh, for this link. But in fact, we don't really need to know what this mechanism is because we already see quantitatively uh, what are the effects that the sun has. And then we'll talk about uh, what does it imply to uh, changes in the 20th century and 21st century. So this is the standard picture that uh, we hear every day from uh, the IPCC. Basically, uh, humans have increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that um, CO2 changes the energy budget. Uh, the estimate that the IPCC uh, uses is that um, we roughly increase the climate's uh, energy budget by about 3.7 watts per square meters if we double the amount of CO2. Um, and then the critical thing is that how do we translate these changes in the energy budget to changes in the temperature, and that's the uh, climate sensitivity. Um, and if, for example, we use uh, the uh, CMIP models, whether it's uh, CMIP 5 or 6, then we typically have uh, some kind of uh, sensitivity that these uh, models give, and this sensitivity is relatively large, so that if you take into account the fact that CO2 increased in the atmosphere, that CO2 changes the energy budget, and that uh, it increases, uh, these changes in the energy budget changes, change the temperature. We expect that temperature over the 20th century should have increased, um, that's called global warming, and uh, indeed we observe that the temperature has increased over the 20th century. That's the standard uh, picture. Now, if climate sensitivity is large, then it means that um, any future increase in the CO2 over the 21st century, if, for example, we go as a, in a business as usual scenario and, for example, double the amount of CO2 over the 21st century, then the temperature will increase by a lot because climate sensitivity is high, and if the temperature is going to increase by a lot, then we are headed for a catastrophe. So this is the standard picture that uh, we hear and which is uh, summarized by the uh, IPCC reports every six years or so. And what is the evidence to support this picture? So first of all, uh, did we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? Uh, yes, we did. We know that because um, we can look at the isotopic composition of um, the carbon in the carbon-14 in the atmosphere until the 1940s and see that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere decreased. And the reason is that when we burn fossil fuels, we burn fuel that was sitting in the ground for millions of years, so all the carbon-14 just uh, decayed away. Uh, so we, when we burn fossil fuels, we decrease the amount of uh, carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Now, uh, from the 1940s, we don't see this effect anymore, but that's because we exploded nuclear uh, explosions in the atmosphere, and these generate uh, carbon-14, so we offsetted it. Okay, so we know we increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, do we change the energy budget? Well, there are calculations that give us, for example, this uh, 3.7, uh, give or take watts per square meter if we double the amount of uh, CO2. Um, and there are some indirect uh, measurements that show you that indeed there is uh, such an effect uh, on the energy budget, um, but they're not perfect, they're not, uh, you cannot really measure this uh, 3.7 uh, watts, so that's why I gave it uh, an imperfect uh, check mark. Another problem, of course, is the warming. Uh, we have uh, heard uh, in this conference uh, problems with the urban heat island uh, affecting uh, the temperature measurements and so on. So we know that the temperature has increased, but we know, don't know exactly by how much. Uh, if the urban heat island effect, for example, uh, uh, contaminates the land uh, surface data and the land warming is only half as much, then it means that we should reduce the global temperature increase by about one-sixth. So, Again, uh, there is a check mark, but it's not uh, perfect. The real problem with the standard scenario, the main caveat, is the fact that we really don't know what climate sensitivity is. What is the value of the climate sensitivity? Um, if you open the IPCC reports, they tell you 
as we heard a few times before, that the climate sensitivity should be anywhere between one and a half to four and a half degree increase if you double the amount of CO2. So basically, this picture is imperfect in the sense that if we, for example, sat in a closed room without being able to measure anything uh, going outside, we wouldn't be able to predict by how much the temperature over the 20th century should have actually increased. We don't, ha we, we don't have models which can actually do that. Now, it's really interesting to understand why models cannot predict a uh, temperature uh, change. Um, we've seen one example uh, in the previous uh, lecture, but let's uh, see where I think is the main uh, problem, the main Achilles heel of the models. So, what is the greenhouse effect? Uh, we have uh, radiation uh, coming uh, from the sun. Some of it is uh, immediately uh, uh, reflected back to space. Some of it uh, reaches the surface and uh, reflected. Um, but most of it is absorbed by the climate system, and then it has to be radiated away. The thing is that the, the atmosphere is opaque to uh, infrared, mostly because of uh, water vapor. Any molecule which is triatomic or larger, or has more than three atoms, uh, absorbs uh, in the uh, infrared. And uh, the most abundant uh, triatomic molecule is, of course, that of water. So uh, the atmosphere is opaque. And that means that instead of uh, emitting, instead of uh, being at equilibrium at the surface with the amount of radiation that we get from, uh, from the sun, the surface which emits the infrared radiation back to space is where the atmosphere becomes uh, transparent, which is, uh, depends on the frequency around 10, 15 kilometers. What that means is that we have to advect the energy from the surface to that level. Uh, somehow, it could be through radiation or through convection, um, but because we need to advect this energy, it means that the temperature at the surface has to be higher so that we can push this heat from the surface upwards. As a consequence, the temperature at the surface is higher than the equilibrium temperature at, the high, at, the, um, at, the, at this level of, say, 10 or 15 kilometers, and therefore it's warmer at the surface. This is the greenhouse effect. Now, what happens if we add another gas, like more CO2 in the atmosphere? The atmosphere is more opaque, um, and it's harder for the atmosphere to radiate uh, this energy away. One way, um, so basically what happens is that all things the same, we reduce the amount of radiation that is emitted back to space. Okay, so... Uh, we are not in equilibrium anymore, so what will happen is that the surface temperature has to increase in order to be able to drive this heat uh, upwards. So we increase the temperature to reach back an equilibrium. Now, if everything would have stayed the same, a, a 3.7 watts per square meter a change in the energy budget would have corresponded to about 1.2 degree increase. So without changing anything else in the atmosphere, a doubling the amount of CO2 should have increased the temperature by 1.2 degrees. However, life is more complicated. Um, a, when we heat the surface, we cause more water vapor to evaporate. So we have more greenhouse gas in the, in the atmosphere, which wants to amplify it. On the other hand, if we have more water vapor in the atmosphere, we have more clouds. And it turns out that the clouds can change uh, the energy budget by quite a lot. And it, turns all, it also turns out that we don't know by how much the cloud cover is going to change. So one of the main differences between different climate models is the recipe that they use in order to describe the change in the cloud cover. And one recipe will give you one sensitivity, and another re recipe will give you another sensitivity. So the recipe you choose in order to describe the cloud cover will basically give you what is the climate model sensitivity. So climate models work uh, in computers. It's called GIGO. It's garbage in, garbage out. OK, I don't know how it translates to German. Um, so. Because of that, uh, cl different climate models have a wide range of uh, climate uh, sensitivities, uh, which, as was mentioned before, is higher than what they actually claim is the range of climate uh, sensitivities. 
Uh, to see that cloud cover are, so, are very important, we can go back to this uh, graph from uh, 89 and look at the range of climate sensitivities. You can see the climate sensitivity on the right uh, axis um, as a function of the intrinsic feedback through cloud covers that you have in the models. Um, at the, at the x-axis, you see by how much does the energy budget change through changes in the cloud cover when we change the temperature. And you see that basically this is the most important parameter affecting the feedback of the climate uh, system. If uh, there is more feedback to the clouds, we'll get a lower uh, climate sensitivity. If we have less feedback from the clouds, we'll have a higher climate sensitivity. This is the knob, which is artificially changed by the climate modelers, which govern the climate sensitivity of the models. Okay, so given that we don't know by how much the cloud cover changes when we change the amount of uh, the temperature or the amount of water vapor, we don't, we cannot use climate models in order to predict by how much the temperature is going to change. Okay, so basically there's a huge caveat in the standard picture, and that is that we cannot predict ab initio what is the climate sensitivity of Earth, and therefore we cannot prove that this picture is correct. So what's the logic of the IPCC? Uh, what they do is they look at additional predictions that uh, the model has, and in particular the two major uh, pr predictions of these models are that the temperature increase uh, should be unprecedented because if it's mostly by humans, then it didn't happen in the past. And the other thing is that um, uh, there is nothing else to explain the warming. If most of the, en uh, the energy budget change over the 20th century is anthropogenic, then it should be the dominant uh, cause of the warming. But these, these uh, arguments are, of course, wrong. Why are they wrong? Okay, so they, they basically reverse uh, the logic. They say, uh, if, if the, the temperature increase is uh, unprecedented and if there's nothing else to explain the warming, then uh, we can go backwards and then therefore claim that climate sensitivity is large and with it predict large temperature increase over the 21st century. But these arguments uh, don't hold water. The first one, the fact that it's unprecedented was uh, of course, uh, boosted with the uh, hockey stick, which we know from uh, the climate gate, which we now, uh, we now uh, uh, celebrate 10 years uh, since it uh, uh, broke out. Um, we know that it's not unprecedented. We also heard from uh, Professor Scafetta that uh, the Middle Ages, for example, were just as uh, warm. Uh, this is another uh, reconstruction based on, um, on uh, boreholes actually measuring the temperature at different uh, depth and, uh, and uh, solving backwards the uh, diffusion equation. And you can see that past times, uh, several thousand years ago, like in the middle Holocene, it was even warmer than, uh, than it is uh, today. So obviously we know that uh, the temperature increase is not necessarily um, unprecedented. The other argument, of course, is that um, there's nothing else to explain the warming. Um, if you try to explain or run the models without taking the anthropogenic forcing into account, you cannot explain what uh, has happened. This, of course, um, assumes that there is nothing else that we have been missing, but there is something, and that is uh, the sun. Okay, so what I want to show you is that the, the real picture is different. We also have the sun uh, taking place um, and... Um, uh, and that would be the rest of the talk. But before that, let me address a few additional arguments that we often hear in, by people in the media or the IPCC. Um, of course, there are uh, non-scientific arguments like 97% of, uh, of the scientists uh, think whatever they think. It doesn't really matter because it's irrelevant. Whenever you have one scientific argument, it trumps um, any any non-scientific arguments uh, like this one. Uh, of course, we see a lot of evidence uh, for the warming. We see, uh, I don't know, at the glaciers receding, or, uh, or I don't know what. We see polar bears uh, stranded on a, on a floating on ice or doing whatever they're doing. So, uh, first of all, we heard from uh, yesterday's talk that uh, the fact that we see a polar bear uh, stranded on an... Uh, on an uh, iceberg doesn't mean that there was even warming. 
But even if we see evidence for warming, because I know what the glaciers in the Alps are receding, it doesn't tell you that it's because of humans. So this argument doesn't hold any water. Another argument that you sometimes hear is that, oh, we see CO2 signature in the stratospheric cooling, or more precisely, the upper stratosphere uh, cooling. Um, and that's because if you have more CO2 in the upper stratosphere, uh, you have more ways of, um, of radiating away the uh, energy, and therefore it cools. So this is evidence of the radiative forcing effect that the CO2 has. It doesn't tell you anything about all the sensitivity and all the feedbacks that you have in the lower part of the atmosphere, and therefore this argument is not important. Another argument that uh, we hear very often um, is that we see the heat in the oceans because uh, we see the ocean, uh, we can measure that the heat in the oceans and we can see that it's, it has increased and therefore it's evidence that uh, it's a anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic warming. Um, one of the things that they don't uh, tell you is that if uh, climate sensitivity is low, it means that the oceans can efficiently or more efficiently lose the heat and therefore, the amount of heat we should see in the oceans is actually lower. Uh, what that means is that in order to explain, uh, if you have an additional source of heat, uh, such as the sun, um, then you would see the, the combined effect of the sun and the anthropogenic uh, uh, greenhouse gases in the oceans, but a lot of it has already escaped. So, just looking at the amount of heat that you have in the oceans also doesn't tell you anything about what the climate sensitivity, uh, nor is it a signature, a particular signature, that uh, CO2 is the main source of this heat. Okay, so these arguments are just uh, chaff, uh, which actually hide away the main caveat, which is we don't know what the climate sensitivity is from climate models. What we have to do, uh, we have to look at a long, uh, or say, empirical evidence, for example, long time scale variations in the CO2 and compare that to the uh, temperature changes. Okay, so the picture I want to present to you is uh, a little bit different. Um, solar, um, um, solar activity increased as well over the 20th century. Um, we, and, uh, and we can also measure and quantify the change in the energy budget associated with solar activity. Um, and we'll see that it's about one to one and a half watts per square meter between when the sun is less active and uh, more active. So that's an additional contribution to the energy budget. So if you want now to explain what has happened in the 20th century, you need a climate sensitivity which is on the low side, a roughly around one to one and a half degree increase per CO2 doubling. And this is also consistent with empirical data that I will show you. Okay, so if the climate sensitivity is on the low side, it means that any future temperature increase will also be modest. Um, another thing which I personally don't understand, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but if I would have believed the story of the IPCC that we are uh, at the break of, uh, of uh, extinction, or what, you know, all those doomsday uh, children that uh, we see running around uh, nowadays, if I would have believed that, I would have said, just a second, there is a very clear solution to it, and that's nuclear power. We can immediately reduce uh, most of our carbon emissions. So even if the IPCC story was correct, just the fact that we, uh, uh, even if the climate sensitivity is high, uh, we, are not, we don't need to ruin the economies and, uh, you know, uh, increase double or triple the, the cost of electricity just because there is a very clear solution. Okay, so that's my two cents uh, on nuclear power. Okay, so let me start by, uh, well, not start, continue by uh, showing you that there is empirical evidence that the climate sensitivity is low, and then I'll show you that we can actually quantify the effect that the sun has in order to complete uh, this picture. So, how do we know that climate sensitivity is uh, low? We can look at different changes in the energy budget and see what is the ensuing changes in the temperature. Uh, one example, which um, was advocated, uh, for example, by uh, uh, Professor Linzen from MIT, is the relatively small response that you find 
uh, once you have large volcanic eruptions like Krakatau or Pinatubo or whatnot, if you look at what the climate models give you, they, t they show you that once you have a large volcanic e eruption and you put dust in the uh, stratosphere, the temperature should decrease typically between 0.3 and 0.5 degrees, while if you look at the average uh, temperature decrease following uh, you can see that here at the bottom, following large volcanic eruptions, this is the average temperature, average in the several years before and after large volcanic eruptions, you see that the temperature decrease is about 0.1 degrees. So it shows you that the actual response of Earth's climate is much smaller than what the models predict. Um, another example is on completely different timescales. Um, on geological timescales, there are large CO2 variations which have nothing to do with, um, with, the, um, a, with the equilibrium with the oceans or things like that. It's uh, CO2 variations uh, because you have more volcanic activity on one hand or less volcanic activity and then CO2 which uh, turns into limestone and settles uh, in the ocean and then recycled inside the earth. So on large timescales, on long timescales, geological timescales, you see variations in the CO2, which are typically a factor of 10 or even more. This is the upper graph. Uh, note that it's a logarithmic scale. So for example, uh, 450 million years ago, we had more than 10 times the amount of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere on one hand. Um, but then we can look at what the temperature was doing. And this is the lower graph. The lower graph is a reconstruction of the um, temperature using uh, isotope ratios in, uh, in fossils. And when you do that, when you re reconstruct the temperature, you find that there were oscillations uh, which actually have nothing to do with the changes of the CO2. So with this complete lack of correlation between CO2 and temperature reconstruction, you can actually place an upper limit of about one point, uh, of about one and a half degree increase per CO2 doubling. Okay, it is much smaller than what the IPCC models uh, give you. Um, in fact, you can show that uh, it's not it's not really an upper limit, but it's a range, and that's because changes in the CO2 affect the acidity of the oceans, which affect the reconstruction of the temperature. So uh, it's a delicate, delicate point, which basically tells you that a lack of correlation between CO2 and rec reconstructed uh, temperature uh, actually gives you a sensitivity range of one to one and a half degree increase. Okay, so, but some of you might have seen uh, Al Gore's uh, movie, or science fiction movie, um, The Inconvenient Truth. And you see that um, in that movie, he showed us this graph where you have a reconstruction of uh, the CO2 at the bottom and uh, the temperature uh, at the top based on ice cores. And you see this very nice correlation between CO2 and temperature. Um, and it might uh, fool you, it fooled Al Gore, but it might fool you to think that CO2 causes large changes in the temperature. Uh, but it's not the case because um, nobody tells you that uh, it's CO2 affecting the temperature and not vice versa. Uh, the real source of this correlation is the fact that there is an equilibrium between CO2 in the atmosphere and CO2 which is dissolved or in the form of carbonic acid in the oceans and there's typically 50 times more CO2 in the oceans than there is in the atmosphere. And this equilibrium depends on the temperature such that when you heat the temperature, you release CO2 and you change this, uh, this equilibrium. So in fact, uh, most of this graph is because CO2 uh, is affected by the temperature and you can see that when you have ice cores with a high enough resolution you see that typically the CO2 lags behind the temperature changes. CO2 should have some effect on the temperature but this graph doesn't tell you anything about it. Okay, so returning back uh, we have seen that there's also empirical evidence to suggest that the climate sensitivity is low. Now let's see what do we see uh, is the effect that uh, the sun has. Okay, so the sun is not a, a constant, it's an a active star which uh, changes uh, its activity and it's manifested by, through many uh, things. For example, you change the number of sunspots, you change the irradiance by about a tenth of a percent, uh, you change the solar wind, you change the amount of x-rays, 
and, uh, and various other things which are related to this uh, non-thermal activity. So the, the sun changes, and we can see that changes in solar activity translate into changes in the climate. This is, uh, we've seen this graph in the morning, but I think it's, it's I think, one of the most impressive uh, graphs in uh, paleoclimatology. You see solar activity reconstructed um, through carbon-14 in tree rings at the top, and uh, uh, this is a proxy of climate, uh, sorry, of solar activity because carbon-14 is formed from cosmic rays uh, uh, coming from outside the solar system, but the flux of these cosmic rays is modulated by solar activity such that when the sun is more active and it has a stronger solar wind, less of these particles can hit the Earth and we have less production of carbon-14. So this is basically a proxy of uh, solar activity. The bottom graph is a, a proxy, or it's the ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16, which is a, a proxy of temperature because water with oxygen-18 is heavier than water with oxygen-16. So the evaporation rates from the oceans uh, depend, uh, are different for the two water molecules, um, but it's temperature dependent. So in this case, it's a proxy of the temperature in the Indian Ocean because this is a reconstructed from oxygen-18 in stalagmites in caves in uh, Oman, which is in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. So you see a very nice correlation, um, and it tells you that either uh, the sun is affecting the climate, or maybe the climate on Earth is affecting the sun. It was a joke. Okay, uh, this is another example. Uh, in this case, it's a reconstruction of the temperature in the northern Atlantic. Uh, what you have here is, a, it's called ice-rafted uh, debris. When it's colder, you have icebergs uh, floating further south, and when they melt, they leave their uh, ice-rafted debris, the dust, at further southern latitude. So if you take a cores from the sea floor, you can actually see whether it was colder or warmer. And again, you can compare that to carbon-14 from tree rings and see an extremely nice uh, correlation showing that the sun affects the climate in the northern Atlantic. So it affects the climate in the northern Atlantic, it affects the climate in the uh, Indian Ocean, and it affects the climate actually globally. Okay, this is another example on a little bit shorter timescales. You can uh, look at the rate of change of the sea level using uh, tide gauges. This is in, uh, in, uh, in the blue line with the arrows uh, in the gray area. Um, and in uh, red, you see the activity of the sun. Um, so I think it's quite clear that when the sun is more active, the oceans are rising, whereas when the sun is less active, the oceans are falling. Okay, so we see that the sun has a large effect on the oceans, or vice versa, and uh, just kidding, the oceans don't affect the sun. Um, but the nice thing is that on short timescales, most of the change in the sea level is because of heat going into the oceans and thermally expanding the oceans. So basically, we can use the oceans now as a huge calorimeter to quantify the effect that the sun has, and see that it's very large. If you don't believe this graph, you can uh, look at other uh, data sets. Uh, since that work was uh, published, uh, we now have uh, very nice uh, satellite uh, data, um, with satellite altimetry uh, telling you what the ocean, uh, sorry, what the ocean uh, sea level is, and you can compare that. This is the ocean sea level without uh, the, the linear increase. You can see that without the linear increase, almost all the sea level change is because of uh, the Sun and El Nino. Uh, you can also do something else. You can take uh, the ocean uh, uh, heat content uh, with uh, uh, buoys that uh, measure the ocean, uh, the temperature at different depth from the 1950s, um, and you can correct that uh, for changes in the... Uh, you can dif uh, differentiate it to get the amount of heat that went into the oceans every year, and you can uh, correct that for the amount of heat because of uh, volcanic forcing. And this is the graph you see at the top. And at the bottom, you see solar activity. Uh, it's a one uh, parameter which uh, describes, uh, in this case, it's, it's called the solar modulation parameter, which is how much is the solar wind affecting the cosmic rays. 
Uh, but again, you see that with the 11-year solar cycle of the sun, every time the sun is more active, a more heat goes into the oceans and vice versa. Okay, so we know for sure, how sure uh, I would bet my house on it, that the sun has a large effect on climate. Um, I'm, I'm joking, uh, my wife wouldn't let me, but uh, I, I, my half, I could... Uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, so you can um, look at the amount of heat that goes into the oceans with different data sets, where it can be satellite altimetry, tide gauges, uh, ocean uh, surface temperature, the heat content I, I showed you. You can also look at how much the clouds are changing and. Uh, and uh, calculate the amount of heat that goes into uh, the Earth system uh, because of that. And you find that between solar minimum and solar maximum, the change in the energy budget is around one to one and a half degree, sorry, one to one and a half watts per square meter. Um, how does that uh, compare to the total solar irradiance? The to total solar irradiance is an order of magnitude smaller. What that tells you is that it cannot be changes in, in the total solar irradiance. It has to be another mechanism which links between solar activity and climate. Okay, so even though the IPCC is artificially uh, trying to minimize the effect of the total solar irradiance um, by removing the, the effects of, say, the, the, the mountain minimum and things like that from the total so solar irradiance, it's not really important because we know the effect is not from the total solar radiance. Now, over the 20th century, solar activity increased. Here we see, again, the solar modulation parameter, which tells you how much is the solar wind affecting uh, the cosmic rays. And you can see the 11-year solar cycle, but the 11-year solar cycle uh, is sitting on secular changes in solar activity. In particular, over the 20th century, solar activity increased. Now, if you have changes of about one watt per square meter because of... Uh, because of changes in solar activity from, say, solar minimum to solar maximum, also this secular increase in solar activity over the 20th century should translate into changes in the energy budget, which the IPCC is doing its best to ignore. Now, this is uh, the changes in the radiative forcings that we see in the IPCC report, the, the last one, the fifth assessment uh, report. This is the changes in the energy budget associated with different components. Again, at the bottom, we see what the IPCC is saying the sun has contributed, but we know for certain, by having measured the amount of heat going into the oceans, that it should be somewhere here. Okay, so this is the big elephant that uh, the IPCC is ignoring. Now, what is uh, this mechanism? Uh, we're, we're going to hear more about it uh, from, um, from uh, Henrik. Um, the mechanism is as follows. Um, it turns out that the solar wind and uh, the cosmic modulating the cosmic rays is not only the proxy for solar activity, it is also the actual link, linking between solar uh, activity and uh, climate. When the sun is more active, it has a stronger solar wind. Um, and as a consequence, we get less of these high energy particles which originate from supernovae, from our, from our galactic uh, vicinity, such that a stronger solar wind will give us less cosmic rays. Less cosmic rays produce less ions in the atmosphere. They are the dominant source of ions in the atmosphere. Uh, well, here in this room, it might be a radon emanating from the concrete, but outside the planetary boundary layer, it's all cosmic rays. And now we know that these ions play a role in the nucleation and then the growth of the cloud condensation nuclei, such that when the sun is more active, we have a stronger solar wind, we have less cosmic rays, less ionization, less cloud condensation nuclei, and therefore clouds with a fewer droplets. These clouds with fewer droplets have a smaller uh, total surface area, so they reflect less of the sunlight such that more of the energy can penetrate the climate system and it's warmer on Earth. So a more active sun gives you a, a, more ac a warmer Earth. Now, do we see that? Uh, again, we're going to uh, see uh, evidence in, uh, in, in the next talk. Uh, we can have, for example, gas 
in the solar winds, which give you reductions in the cosmic rays, which translate into changes in the cloud parameters. I'm not going to elaborate because uh, um, Henrik is going to do that after me. Um, however, we also have evidence uh, on long time scales. We can look at changes in the cosmic ray flux, which have nothing to do with solar activity. Just because as the as, uh, Earth is um, orbiting the galaxy, the environment around us changes, and sometimes we have more supernovae and more cosmic rays around us, and sometimes we have less. And over the past billion years, we can reconstruct the flux of cosmic rays reaching us using uh, meteorites, using iron meteorites. And when you do that, you find a very clear periodicity of around 145 million years. Basically, what happens is that uh, every so often, we pass through spiral arms of the Milky Way, and when we pass through a spiral arm of the Milky Way, there are more supernovae, more cosmic rays, more clouds, or clouds which are whiter, and therefore it's colder on Earth. Um, and in fact, over the past billion years, every about 150 million years, uh, in sync with the passage of the spiral arms, we see that it's colder on Earth. So here at the bottom you see a reconstruction of the cosmic ray flux, and here you see a reconstruction of the temperature, and the cosmic ray flux explains the temperature variations. On a, a, a little bit shorter time scales, we are also moving up and down the galactic plane. We can reconstruct the temperature. Uh, you can see that uh, here. Uh, these are the 150 million year oscillations, but overlaid on that, you see faster oscillations of 32 million years, um, and that corresponds very nicely to the fact that we are oscillating up and down the galactic plane. The phases agree. There's also a secondary modulation because the, the distance from the galactic center changes, and we all see that in the data. So what does it imply to our, the understanding of 20th century climate change? When the sun... Uh, okay, the, the standard picture is such that uh, most of the radiative forcing is anthropogenic. The climate sensitivity is relatively high, and therefore, uh, um, th it explains the temperature increase that uh, we have seen. But if the climate sensitivity is high, it would tell you that uh, the tw 21st century uh, temperature increase should be high as well. However, we have seen that there is la another large contributor of uh, changes in the energy budget, and that's solar activity. So the net change in the energy budget is much larger, and therefore, in order to explain the same temperature increases over the 20th century, you need a climate sensitivity which is low. And if the climate sensitivity is low, and again, which is consistent with the uh, empirical data, then the temperature increase over the 21st century should be low as well. Uh, how am I doing with time? I, do. I, have, I should stop. Okay, so uh, I won't tell you what will happen in the future. Um, I can tell you that you can fit the 20th century very nicely with a climate sensitivity which is very low. You can integrate forward in time and see that uh, the temperature increase is going to be relatively modest. Okay, so let me end with uh, the summary slide. We, the arguments, the main arguments that the sun uh, sorry, the main arguments that we have seen in the standard picture are wrong. They don't support this picture. And there's a very big caveat. This big caveat is that if there is another climate driver, then in order to explain what has been going on, you need a low climate sensitivity. And I showed you the evidence that the sun is this additional uh, climate driver, and therefore future climate warming is going to be modest. And now I'll uh, give uh, the stage to Henrik, and I think the Q&A is going to be afterwards, right? Okay. Is your computer? Please. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank, dear. Als nächstes kommt Professor Dr. Henrik Svensmark. Professor Svensmark is director of this Center for Sun Research, the Danish National Space Center. He was from 1988 to at the University of Berkeley, California, at the Nordic Institute of Theoretical Physics and at the Niels Bohr Institute. Tätig. Anschließend arbeitet er am Danish Meteorological Institute. Svensmark wurde zusammen mit Eigil Fries Christiansen 1997 durch Arbeiten zu einem Zusammenhang zwischen kosmischer Strahlung und dem Klimawandel bekannt. Sie stellten dies als Kosmoklimatologie vor. 
Svensmark untersuchte den Zusammenhang zwischen kosmischer Strahlung und der Wolkenbildung in der unteren Atmosphäre. Und in beiden Fällen stellte er teilweise überlappende Zusammenhänge fest. Im Falle von Sonnenflecken war dies bereits früher vermutet worden, so bereits von Wilhelm Herschel, anhand des Meander-Minimums, deren Parallelität zur kleinen Eiszeit im 17. Jahrhundert lag. Das zur Überprüfung von Svensmarks Theorie durchgeführte Projekt Sky legte die Grundlage für das erst 2014 am CERN abgeschlossene Forschungsprojekt Cloud. Und das zum Thema Forschen, was ich anfangs äh, kurz äh, angeschnitten hatte, als ich äh, Herrn Svensmark anfragte für die Konferenz, meinte er, ja, ich habe bis jetzt noch keine neuen Veröffentlichungen gemacht, was der Voraussetzung ist, dass denn die neue Forschung abgeschlossen ist. Und da ist das, was man, ähm, das, das muss man betonen, das hatte ich das letzte Mal auch schon mal erwähnt, dass praktisch die Forschung, die nicht in den Mainstream passt, die Forschungsergebnisse, die nicht die übliche These des ausschließlich menschengetriebenen Klimawandels unterstützt, ebenso gut wie keine Forschungsgelder mehr bekommt. Und ähm, wir hatten das schon das letzte Mal erwähnt, dass einer der Teilnehmer unserer kon früheren Konferenzen das mitbekommen hat und es ermöglicht hat, dass hier Forschung dann privat weitergeführt werden konnte. Also für diejenigen, die hier dabei sind oder das auf YouTube sehen oder im Livestream, äh, vielleicht fragen Sie Ihrem Bekanntenkreis nach, ernst gemeinter Vorschlag und bitte auch, ob hier nicht mal weiter die Forschung unterstützt werden kann. So, without much further ado, Henrik, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm going through. Good. So, <clears throat> I'm going to continue uh, more or less where Nia uh, stopped, at least uh, put some uh, physics into, uh, I mean, the mechanism that we have been uh, investigating for a number of years. Uh, I should say that uh, we are a small group that have been working on this. Uh, Nia is part of it, then my colleague Martin Enghoff, and actually my son, Jakob, has uh, also been part of this. Uh, Nia and I, we, uh, at some point, uh, a number of years back, we decided to collaborate because we had been chasing our t uh, each other's tales uh, for quite a while. And it was uh, annoying that Nia, he published things that I was working on uh, before I got to publish things. So uh, that's why we, is that a problem? So I'm being fixed. Can you hear me now? Okay. So now I can hear myself. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to talk about uh, this link uh, that we have been working on for quite a while, the empirical evidence for a link we have heard a lot about today already. Um, but we have to understand uh, the microphysical link, why there should be such a link between uh, cosmic rays, cloud and climate. Uh, and I'm finally, I will say also say something about the uh, implications on the long time scales, uh, just as Nier did, because I think it's, it, it's really uh, an interesting uh, uh, possibility that we are uh, exploring. So the main character in all I'm going to talk about today, it is actually cosmic rays. And what are cosmic rays? Well, they are a, what we call a non-terminal uh, population of relativistic particles, which means that they are moving at the speed of light, more or less, but they are actually quite important uh, in the Milky Way. They are important for the uh, stability uh, of, of the interstellar media, uh, so it has a pressure which is more or less the same as the pressure from gases. Um, and they are everywhere. They are in the Milky Way, they are in all galaxies, they are in inter intergalactic uh, space. So why should we care about these cosmic rays? Well, they are important, uh, but the most uh, you know, interesting thing is that they, they seem to be important for climate. And what I will show you, uh, they might even have some impact uh, on the conditions uh, for life. Uh, here uh, on Earth. And of course, there's a lot of interesting physics, but a little bit of the history. Uh, already Coulomb in 18, uh, 1785, 
he found out when, when he, he charged one of these gold leaves here, uh, when it became charged, he discovered that the, it, that, uh, the system was uh, discharging uh, much faster than you would expect from just a leak current. So something was in the air that made uh, this uh, instrument, which is called electroscope, uh, to discharge. And uh, of course, uh, in 1896, uh, you know, Becquerel, he discovered uh, spontaneous uh, radioactivity, and later Marie Curie and uh, Pierre Curie, they discovered uh, polonium and so on, radioactive uh, elements. So quite early, we knew that uh, there was something that, uh, some kind of a dark current uh, in the absence of any sources, and Rutherford suggested that most of this dark current was actually from radioactivity. Then there were some ideas. They didn't know whether it was coming from the Earth, from radioactive elements, or it came from the, uh, the atmosphere. And uh, there was a test in the Eiffel Tower uh, where they actually saw, or he saw, that the, that, uh, the amount of uh, uh, this dark current, it was going down by a factor of two. So he suggested that it came from the, uh, the Earth. The things were not really uh, clarified before Victor Hess in 1912. He made a number of uh, balloon uh, where he took an uh, instrument up uh, to about five kilometers or something like that. And he saw that it increases uh, as you go higher up. So he's, he made the uh, observation that uh, this is most uh, likely to be explained by the assumption that the radiation, uh, it comes from above our atmosphere. And that was sort of the start of cosmic rays. Um, here you see a spectrum of cosmic rays, and that's one of the reasons there are some really interesting physics uh, behind this. Uh, here you have the intensity uh, of the, fr uh, that is the flux of cosmic rays. It's more than 30 orders of magnitude. Um, and then you have the energy, and up here you have 10 to the 20th uh, electron volts, these are macroscopical uh, energies, they're really high uh, energies, but you see that these particles are of the very high energy are only happening, you know, once per square kilometer per year, so these are very rare. As we go higher, uh, or lower, uh, sorry, lower into the energy, we have one particle per square meter per year, so they are also very rare. So we have to go up to this low part before uh, we get uh, particles that are relatively frequent, and these are the ones that enters into the atmosphere and do most of the things that uh, we are interested in, in uh, with respect to, uh, to, to climate. So one of the big problems has been what is accelerating these particles? How do you get these high energies? And the idea is it has to do with supernovas. So when you have a supernova, you get this shock front here, uh, and the particles, they diffuse, and each time they pass this this uh, region here, uh, they add a little energy, and th that is what we would call an, uh, an uh, you know, a galactic uh, accelerator uh, of these particles. So this is the origin of all the lower energies that, that uh, we are interested in. These are, they, they come from uh, supernovas. So when we have a particle that goes into the atmosphere, it creates a shower structure where you produce a lot of uh, the different types of particles, and uh, it, this is in itself is very interesting. What is interesting in this context is that uh, we produce uh, ions in the atmosphere. The ions are important uh, when we talk about clouds, which, as I will do in a sh uh, just in a, in a minute, minute. But you also produce new isotopes, and you've already seen that, uh, that uh, we can use these isotopes to say something about how the sun has changed in time uh, if we go back, because some of the carbon-14, for instance, goes into a tree, uh, and you can then look at a certain tree ring and see how much carbon-14 there is compared to carbon-12, uh, and that says something about uh, the solar uh, activity back in time. And the reason is, if we look at the solar uh, system where we have the sun in the middle and we have the planets, we have the sun's magnetic field, and that works as a shield against cosmic rays that tries to enter into the uh, solar system. If the sun is very active, uh, fewer cosmic rays can enter uh, into uh, the solar system. So the sun can actually modulate how many cosmic rays 
are entering uh, or arrives uh, in the top of the atmosphere. Now, the thing is that each time you have a change in the intensity of cosmic rays, then there is a change in climate. And there's so much empirical evidence. This figure you actually have seen already a few times, but it's over the Holocene period, that is the last 10,000 years. And you can see uh, where you have the drift ice that is uh, over the North Atlantic, and you have the carbon-14, and you have this beautiful uh, correlation. So this is just one example. The other example I'm showing here is uh, the last 1,000 years, where you see here the medieval warm period, the li little ice age, and then the modern period. Uh, and if you compare this with solar activity, which is actually carbon-14 and beryllium-10, another cosmogenic isotope, you actually see a very nice correlation between the two uh, curves. And it all suggests that, uh, I mean, this is part of this empirical evidence that says that if you have a change in solar activity and you change the cosmic rays, uh, it looks as if climate is changing uh, at the same time. So, more historically, but also what is going on uh, presently is that uh, y one idea uh, is that, of course, it's solar irradiance that is uh, uh, influencing uh, climate. However, um, the change in solar irradiance, uh, at least from the IPCC, is so small that it will not really have any effect. Uh, you can see here that uh, from 1880 uh, to present, they say that uh, this is the uh, size of uh, the effect of the sun. And if this is the only way that the sun could influence climate, it would be so small that uh, the effect of the sun would be something that you could just uh, ignore. Um, there are, of course, ideas where you talk about having even larger changes in uh, solar irradiance. For instance, uh, on the order of 0.4%, which means that you would have uh, about on the order of 6 watt per square meter. This is, of course, large. Uh, but in order to have such a large change in the solar irradiance, um, you have to have uh, changes in what we call the quiet sun's uh, uh, irradiance. And it turns out that when you look, for instance, uh, at these, uh, we call them spectrohelograms of the solar disk, and you look at the quiet part of the sun, then over the last 100 years where you have uh, these uh, nice photographs, uh, it does not look as if the quiet uh, irradiance is changing. So it seems to be inconsistent uh, that uh, you could have such large uh, uh, variations in the uh, solar irradiance. And, and that's at least uh, how I see it. Now, recently, there's, I mean, when we talk about solar activity, we have had uh, the observations of sunspots going back uh, 400 years uh, of that order. But recent, I mean, and then over the last 400 years, in all the reconstructions, you had sort of an increase in the solar activity uh, measured by sunspot. But there have been some reconstructions. One is here by uh, Svalgaard and Shadden, where they sort of uh, made a recalibration of these sunspot numbers because there's been different observers. And they got that uh, the solar uh, activity is more or less the same when you go back to the 17th uh, uh, century. So they are, and that was claimed as if, uh, you know, the sun cannot have had any influence uh, on climate change. But if we look at uh, the cosmic ray flux, uh, and this is uh, beryllium-10 that you have up here, we actually see that there has been a decline uh, over the last 400 years, uh, or this is 600 years. Um, and this decline, uh, this, this corresponds that you have a more active sun, so it screens are better against cosmic rays. So solar activity has increased over this period of time. So the cosmic rays, uh, which are measured here, seems to indicate that there has been an increase in solar activity uh, over this period. So what Nia showed uh, was that uh, we had these uh, 
uh, we could see how much energy, we could quantify uh, how much energy goes into the oceans and uh, that we need some kind of a amplification mechanism in order to explain what's going on. And one of the big uh, or the important uh, um, candidates for this is actually changes in cloud because the changes that we see are uh, of the right order. Solar irradiance, on the other hand, seems to be too small. So, and here we have satellite observations of the solar irradiance uh, here. So we know that this cannot explain what we are seeing here. So we have to have a amplification mechanism. Um, and the obvious thing uh, that we have been talking about in this beautiful picture here, uh, this is more or less uh, this month. Um, you see what, you know, if you look at Earth from space, you see clouds. Uh, they are everywhere, they're very dynamic. So they are probably very, very important for the radioactive uh, budget. The net effect of clouds is to, cool, what's that? The net effect uh, is to cool uh, square meter. What is going on here? So, yeah. so the net effect is to cool uh, the Earth with about 30 watts uh, uh, per square meter. So if you have a systematic change in the cloud cover, it will be a very effective way of changing the Earth's uh, energy budget. And uh, I mean, many things seem to indicate that's going on. Here you see what actually started uh, much of uh, this work which is a correlation between cosmic rays and uh, uh, satellite observations of clouds. So this is uh, from 83 until present. And the red curve here is the change in cosmic rays as measured by uh, neutron monitors. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the, 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 the change that you see here is as because of the solar activity. So this is the 11 year solar cycle you see. So when you have a small amount of cosmic rays or fewer cosmic rays, it's because the sun is very active. Whereas here uh, you have a, 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 a solar uh, minimum and you have much more cosmic rays coming in. The blue curve is changes in low clouds over this period. And uh, you know, I mean, I always say that maintaining this uh, type of uh, you know, satellites over such a long period is very difficult. So, there are some calibration problems, and that's why it ends at 2006. So if there is a link between cosmic rays and cloud, what is the link? Well, the idea is that we have cosmic rays entering into the atmosphere. It makes charges, so it uh, uh, makes ions, and the ions, they sit on gases, uh, and the gases start to uh, clump uh, together, uh, so you get these clusters. Uh, and the clusters are then more stable because you have these uh, ions in the clusters. And then subsequently, the, the, these are you know, only about three nanometer. They have to grow up until about 50 nanometer. And then they can work or act as a cloud condensation nuclei. So if you have uh, these cloud condensation nuclei, then water vapor can condense, and in order to form a cloud droplet, you have to have these cloud condensation nuclei. And if you change the number of cloud condensation nuclei, you change the properties of clouds. And you can see that uh, very beautifully uh, in the next picture. What you see is the satellite observations, uh, and you see this is a region over the oceans where, where you have low clouds, and all these stripes is ships sailing along and they are pumping out, uh, you know, from the dirty fuel, uh, aerosols, uh, which are large enough to become cloud condensation nuclei, and so they are changing uh, uh, the cloud properties in these, uh, these areas. And this is quite dramatic here, but smaller things can also do it. So, we, we had this theory and we could now test it in, uh, in the laboratory and this is what, something we have been doing uh, over the last uh, 15 years, more so. Um, what you see here 
is one of the first uh, results that we got. So what you have here is the ionization. So this corresponds to the cosmic rays. So we can increase the ionization in our chamber. And then we can measure how many small particles that we are producing when uh, we, uh, when we uh, increase the ionization. And you see that there is, a, uh, there is some uh, linear uh, correspondence. So you increase the ionization, you produce more of these small uh, aerosols. And at, at first we thought that uh, maybe we are, we are you know, at home now because now we have a mechanism. We just produce more small aerosols and then the aerosol go to cloud, cloud condensation nuclei and that would change the properties of clouds. But it turns out that the, these very small aerosol has to grow uh, to almost 50 uh, nanometer. And if you produce more of these small aerosols, there's a big chance that some of them would get lost to the larger ones. And if you had, or you had all these climate models that tried to investigate this effect and uh, they actually saw uh, they didn't, that, I mean, these small aerosols did not survive to cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, so that was a very negative result. So what we did was try to see if we could mimic uh, these conditions in an experiment. So first we had our uh, experimental setup. We put in some uh, small uh, aerosols and then uh, we put in some extra aerosols and then we see what is the fate of these small aerosols as they grow. And it turns out that as they grow, they get lost to the other aerosols and to the walls. And uh, when they are about the size of cloud condensation nuclei, the relative change of the number of aerosols is more or less the same as when we started. And uh, this is in complete agreement with the computer uh, modeling. So, where is that? Oh, I should show you this one. So, when we did the same experiment, but with ionization in the chamber, then we actually saw that all the particles, they grow to cloud condensation nuclei. So there is a mechanism, uh, or at that time we, we realized there had to be some kind of a mechanism that could explain this. If we look at the, uh, the climate models here, uh, these, these are, a, here you have the diameter of the particles, so here you, you, you have the very small particles and here you have the cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, and you would expect that uh, if you add, you know, about 5% more small particles in order to get what we expect from observations, then the models should show that uh, the number of particles would end up there. But what you see is that uh, they, I mean, this is what we would expect. And this is what uh, the models are showing. So that would mean that it's completely uh, negligible. So we spent an, actually uh, a number of years trying to figure out what was going on. And I'm not going to go through it uh, in any details uh, here, but the result is that ions are also helping the growth of cloud condensation, uh, the growth of aerosols into uh, cloud condensation nuclei. So there is a process where we both produce new aerosols and we, um, we, the ions are helping the formation of cloud condensation nuclei, and we believe that might be uh, the case. So the obvious question is, uh, uh, I mean, people were saying, okay, this is your experiment, um, but it probably doesn't work in the real atmosphere because there are so many aerosols and there are so many processes uh, in the real uh, system. But it turns out that you can actually observe the whole chain uh, in the atmosphere because sometimes you have these uh, coronal mass ejections that you see here. This is the, the sun. You cannot see the direct light, but you can see the atmosphere. And uh, you have some plasma that is thrown out and then the cosmic rays all of a sudden makes a drop uh, and it could be on the order of 30%. Here is uh, another nice picture of uh, you know, some of these disturbances that you see uh, from the sun, how they are moving out. Uh, into the uh, interplanetary uh, space, and they are affecting the cosmic rays. And this is the, uh, the, the figure that also Nia was showing. But the interesting thing is that the red curve is the drop in cosmic rays, 
And this curve here is the change in aerosols. So all of a sudden we have fewer aerosols going into the uh, atmosphere when we have a drop in the cosmic rays. And we also see the change in liquid water, uh, in this is liquid water in the clouds over the oceans. Uh, we see it in a different satellite set. Uh, this is the MODIS data set and this is the ISKIP data set. So we see this effect everywhere. So we can say that we see the whole chain from, from cosmic rays to aerosols to clouds. And the changes that we have are sufficient uh, to explain, uh, I mean, they are in the right order of what we would uh, expect. So let me summarize the mechanism. Um, the idea is that we have the galaxy that uh, produces uh, cosmic rays, uh, it produces ions. Then we have the sun, uh, it helps uh, the formation of sulfuric acid. But because of these ions uh, that we have, it helps the stabilization of small clusters, which then subsequently grow also because of the ions uh, into cloud condensation nuclei. And when we have the cloud condensation nuclei, we change the cloud cover. And by changing the cloud cover, we can change the, uh, I mean, how much energy goes into the Earth's uh, system. So that is more or less the mechanism that I've been talking about. And now the last few things, which is on a completely different time scale but I think it's also very interesting. So uh, cosmic rays, uh, I mean, I'm, we're talking about modulation by uh, the sun, but now we're talking about uh, star formation and uh, these, the number of supernovas that are uh, you know, around the solar system. So I did some work where I looked at, uh, tried to reconstruct uh, cosmic rays uh, over the last 500 million years, you can see these uh, waves that you have here uh, going uh, up and, and, and down. And the thing is, uh, Nia showed that it had a, a big influence on climate. What I'm going to show to you is that it seems as if it also has a big influence on uh, uh, the conditions for life uh, here uh, on Earth. And in 2008, there was a very large uh, uh, study uh, where they looked at the marine invertebrate uh, and looked at the, the changes in diversity uh, over the last uh, about 500 million years. And the results look something like this. You see, uh, this is uh, uh, you know, more or less present and this is 500 million years back in time. And you see the changes in the number of uh, genera, uh, they're going up and down. And, and a big question has been, you know, what is the cause of such changes? Uh, and there's been many uh, ideas uh, from sea level uh, to, of course, volcanic uh, eruptions, uh, plate tectonics, uh, and so on. But it turns out, uh, if I take just two things, which is the sea level and changes in climate, I can actually uh, explain things. Uh, I, mean, I get a remarkable uh, result. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here you see the sea level change over the last 500 million years. Uh, if you notice here the axis, this, this is a real sea level change. This is uh, hundreds of meters uh, going up and down. So this is, uh, you see that if we go back, you know, about 70 million years, the sea level was, was much higher. Uh, 700 meters uh, than uh, it is present. And why is that important for the number of uh, genera? Well, when you have a higher sea level, you have the continent, they are flooded. And that means that you can have species uh, inside here and they are sort of isolated from each other. And you have more regions where you can have uh, different species. That means that if the sea level goes up, you can have more uh, species. Uh, so that is the idea why the, uh, why the sea level enters into it. The other thing that enters was climate. And if we assume that climate is related to this change in cosmic rays that you see here, then when I, when I uh, what normalize the number of uh, genera with the sea level and then plot it, so this is, uh, this, this curve here is only astrophysics. 
and I then show you uh, a curve which is only uh, related to um, uh, the Earth and the uh, genera and sea level, you see that there's a beautiful uh, correlation. So it, it, it indicates at least that uh, this mechanism that we are talking about uh, might be extremely important and I think therefore it is uh, necessary to understand these things in a, in a much better way. So this is the last uh, thing I had to say. Um, so variations, uh, each time you have a variation in cosmic rays, suddenly you have a change in Earth's climate. And I mean, everything suggests that clouds are the real player uh, in this. And clouds are, of course, the, the least understood part of the climate mm. system. Uh, we believe that we understand uh, this mechanism uh, to a much larger degree than the one when we started. Uh, it involves ions and aerosol formation. And uh, by having the aerosols, we are linking to clouds and therefore, of course, the energy budget of the Earth. And the final thing is that if you understand this link, uh, it seems to have uh, implications for uh, our understanding of uh, you know, the changing conditions that we have had uh, for life uh, here, here on Earth, not just climate. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you just go on stage? Yes. Okay. You have a headset near for your legs. Good. Erschöpf and alles beantwortet. Die Fragen, okay, nochmal. Sie stellen auf Deutsch Ihre Frage. Wer unbedingt auf Englisch sprechen will, bitte, aber wir haben drei professionelle Damen, die ich immer noch nicht richtig mit Namen vorgestellt habe. Weiß gar nicht, ob ich das soll. Ähm, und. Bitte, Ihre Fragen da sind welche. Okay. Konrad Rutscher, Austria. I, I want to know why you did not point out to the changes of the ma magnetic field and the possible impact of solar winds on this magnetic field of the Earth. Yeah, so I, I didn't talk about the Earth's magnetic field. I guess that's what the question. Uh, so the Earth's magnetic field is, of course, also important uh, because uh, it regulates uh, how many particles that enters into the atmosphere. In in the polar regions, it's very easy to, for particles to go into the atmosphere, whereas uh, in so uh, the Earth's magnetic field is also having a, a, an effect. Uh, it's not something that we have done a lot of work with on, but we, 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 know, we know that it changes. The thing is that um, the, um, on the time scales, that, okay, because the magnetic field of the Earth stops the particles which are typically at energies below which uh, you need in order to penetrate the whole atmosphere, switching off Earth's magnetic field altogether um, doesn't change the atmospheric ionization by that much. It is comparable to what you get between when the sun is not active and when it's active. However, on the long time scales that the magnetic field of Earth changes, you have other things, such as the Milankovitch cycles, which affect as well, and therefore the magnetic, uh, the signal that you get from changes in the Earth's magnetic field are not uh, dominant on any time scale. So you have to be more careful when you're looking for them. But yeah, you should see some effect, and there are claims that you see effects because of uh, changes in Earth's magnetic field. Okay, Müller Platt from Berlin. Uh, thank you for your very interesting talk uh, with um, con uh, convincing us from of a very uh, yeah good altern alternative hypothesis. I have a question to Professor um, Schwenzmark concerning statistics. Um, you showed us a slide um, with a strong correlation between cloud cover and uh, galactic cosmic rays. I think you remember that slide. Um, would you mind to put that on again? Yeah. Or if, it's, if it takes too long, I can... Uh, it's come out. Yep. That yeah, one? that that um, the, um, the range of cloud cover is only between 10, 27 and 30 percent and I think that's a 
quite small range. And uh, my question is, uh, how, do you, how is it measured, cloud cover percentage, and could you comment on the accuracy of that measurement? Yeah, it, it, this is a particular uh, data set which is called the ISKIP uh, data set, the International Satellite Cloud Climate Project. Uh, so this is measured using all the geostationary uh, satellites and uh, at least two uh, polar orbiting satellites from NASA. And uh, the problem is that uh, this is a very long time period. So uh, the, the, the satellite, they fail at, at a different time. So, so, so the, you, always, you have new generations of satellites coming up. So it's very difficult to maintain a calibration over this long period. Uh, and the calibration has been, uh, you know, there has been, we, we, we tried to correct this data set with the calibration. So the reason I'm showing you this is simply because it was sort of the initial start of uh, the whole uh, idea. Um, and I, I think that the first part of this uh, figure is okay, but now we know that the calibration is gone in this uh, data set. Uh, the change which is on the order of these 2% is really what you need. I mean, you have to have this accuracy in order to see what we are talking about. So it has to be in this order. Uh, and it is on the limit of what you can do with satellites. So if you have a single satellite uh, and only measuring with one satellite, it actually only comes back to the same point every 12 hours so that you don't know what's going on for at least 12 uh, hours. So you, you have to have many satellites and it's really difficult to calibrate uh, this, uh, this whole system. So at, at the moment, we don't have any satellite systems that can actually measure these things uh, with, uh, with the, the, the needed accuracy. So, so that's a real problem. And that's why we went over to, to look at these short time changes uh, over uh, you know, 20 or 30 days, uh, because here we don't have these calibration problems. Okay. Yeah, done. Könnten Sie uns vielleicht noch etwas Näheres darüber mitteilen, wie die kleinsten Aerosole von drei Nanometer aufwärts sich zusammenraufen, um nachher ein Cluster von 50 und höher zu bilden? Well, uh One of the most important molecules for, for this clustering is actually sulfuric acid. And uh, sulfuric acid is sort of, a, you know, it's produced completely naturally uh, in the atmosphere. It's mainly from algae uh, uh, over the oceans uh, that when they die, they send out uh, what you call DMS. And uh, that is uh, then transferred into uh, uh, SO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, and then Uh, you know, it reacts with ozone and water and becomes sulfuric acid. It's a completely natural uh, uh, me mechanism. But the sulfuric acid, it's, it's like the super glue of the atmosphere. It, it really likes to stick together. Um, and if you have an ion on it, because it's a polar molecule, uh, it, 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 it makes the stability much uh, stronger. So when you have few uh, or less uh, sulfuric acid, then by having the ions, Uh, they actually stabilize uh, these small clusters. As soon as they are stable, then they can start to take up all kinds of things uh, and water and more, uh, you know, sulfuric acid molecules, other organic molecules and so on. And then uh, they slowly grow. But uh, when they are small, it's, 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 it is a dangerous life for the small aerosols because they, they get uh, uh, eaten by larger aerosols. So that's the fate of many of them. So It's not all of them that becomes cloud condensation nuclei. Do you have any comments? Okay, I get tired in my arm. Yeah. Um, I, I have a small question about the clouds and their um, regarding the, their role on the, or their impact on the climate or temperature. Especially, uh, could you tell me or could you talk about the uh, um, reflection of heat rays coming from the Earth compared to the reflection of heat rays directly coming from the Sun? Sure. 
Um, I mean, clouds has two effects. They both heat and they uh, cool the surface. So uh, the short wave is that uh, they reflect uh, the short wave, I mean, the sunlight out to space again. But we all know that uh, when there is a, a cloudy uh, uh, e evening, it, it's always warmer. And that's the, uh, I mean, you have a strong greenhouse effect from clouds. So you have two large effects. One is the, the solar effect, uh, where you have the radiation going out, and then you have the green, uh, greenhouse effect of clouds. So you have two large, uh, one is warming and one is cooling. So you have to subtract these two from each other, and then you get about, uh, you know, below clouds on the order of 15 watts uh, per square meter cooling. So the cooling is what uh, uh, wins in the end. Oh, yes, it, it changes uh, with the height of the clouds because if you have high, thin clouds, uh, then because they are thin, uh, solar radiation goes through, so their net effect is actually a heating of the Earth, which is not a very large effect. Uh, so the, the, the dominating effect of clouds is actually from, uh, you know, the, the, the low clouds over the ocean, marine stratus clouds, which are everywhere. They, they are the ones that are cooling uh, the planet. Assuming that um, the, the Arctic region is warming up, and uh, if we know that the solar wind follows the magnetic field lines, do you see a correlation between your theory and the Arctic warming? Um, you, you shouldn't say, uh, I mean, um, the fact that uh, the magnetic field lines funnel uh, uh, the solar wind to the uh, poles, which is why you see the uh, aurora at uh, polar regions, um, has nothing to do with uh, this mechanism because uh, uh, most, of, uh, the I most of the ions in the atmosphere are formed from a high energy particles with an energy of typically 10 or 15 GV or more, which are the energies of which the secondaries can penetrate the atmosphere. So the solar wind doesn't have any direct effect on uh, the climate. It's all stopped in the uh, top uh, tens of kilometers in the atmosphere. Uh, it is true that it stopped mostly in higher latitudes, but it doesn't have any effect on, uh, on, uh, lower, uh, on, on lower uh, altitudes. Now, the reasons that uh, in any climate uh, model or any mechanism, most of the warming of the polar regions is anyway not by direct heating from the sun at uh, these uh, latitudes, but how effective can you advect energies from tropical regions to uh, a high latitude regions? And this basically depends on the amount of water vapor you have because most of this uh, energy transport is through a latent heat of, uh, of water vapor. You evaporate water in tropical regions. Um, you evaporate the tropical regions, uh, it takes energy, and then when you condense the water vapor, you release this energy. So any mechanism that heats the Earth will tend to heat the polar regions any, uh, more. And uh, so this is not a signature for any particular mechanism. Thanks for great presentations, Nir and, and Hendrik. I have a question on sunshine hours. Uh, we, we heard that how complicated it is to measure the clouds by satellite, and there's the low clouds, the high clouds, and so forth. C can you do anything with the sunshine hours as measured in the weather stations? And have you done any regional differentiation that there may be trends that are different in different regions? Um, no, the short answer is no. <laughs> The thing is that uh, we were really interested, I mean, after we found the uh, large-scale variations, which, I mean, we're not interested in local uh, variations. As interesting as it, it may be, we're interested in the global effects and in uh, evidence for the particular mechanism, the fact that it's through uh, cloud cover and cosmic rays. So it could be that, you know, in, uh, there are some effects in, uh, you know, in the UK or in Germany or in, uh, you know, Patagonia. But it's not something that really interests us uh, directly. We want to see the global uh, effects. Um, so it could be that you can use uh, sunshine hours to get some handle, but 
Because we expect the effect to be larger over oceans, uh, that data set would uh, probably be somewhat incomplete for us and therefore not necessarily relevant. Thanks. So my question aims towards uh, Professor Svensmark. Um, you just mentioned that the net effect of cloud building is a cooling one. So if you're following, if you are, if I'm following rightly your assumptions, uh, then actually um, the Earth has a long-term uh, self-regulatory effect. That means like the more uh, solar activities, the more clouds, and then it cools again. So on long term, we should actually cool if the activity grows, or how can I interpret it? Well, I mean, there, 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 are, there are, of course, some uh, feedback uh, mechanisms, uh, no, no doubt, which is something that uh, we don't know. I, I'm not sure that, uh, that there's a self-regulating mechanism. I don't know what you're saying here. There are feedbacks in the climate system, but I think uh, the fact that the climate sensitivity is relatively on the low side just tells you that they are not uh, as large, they're much smaller than what uh, the IPCC is, uh, is advocating. Um, and basically what it means is that uh, uh, there are no large net uh, feedbacks, uh, there are feedbacks to the clouds which have to maybe cancel out other feedbacks like that of water vapor. So um, it's a kind of... Um, of a, of, of a cloud feedback that stabilizes the, the system. Uh, the cosmic rays are then an offset knob that offsets uh, whether uh, you're going to have more clouds or less clouds. Uh, with regards to the first part of your question, I think in the future, um, it is true that if you have, uh, now that the sun is becoming less active, we should expect a, ne um, a negative change in the, uh, in the energy budget, which would drive towards cooling. But again, uh, there is also the effect of uh, CO2, uh, even though it's, uh, it's much smaller than what the IPCC is uh, telling us, it is still there. So I won't necessarily expect the temperature to now decrease by say one degree or anything like that in the, in the near future. My name is Dietrich Wittlieb von Eichel. Ein, ein besonders wichtiger Punkt wäre, meine ich hier, die Frage, wie hoch ist der Effekt der kosmischen Strahlung auf den Anstieg der Globaltemperatur seit der kleinen Eiszeit? Das ist ja die wesentliche Frage. Ich habe die, den Effekt der CO2-Emissionen seit dieser Zeit auf 0,2 Grad berechnet. Der Rest, egal wo dann der, wie hoch der Anstieg nun gewesen sein mag, kann dann nur von der Sonne kommen. Aber lässt sich der einigermaßen quantifizieren? Um, if you try to um, a simulate the 20th century by leaving a, a things like the climate sensitivity, the free parameter, and the effect that the sun has as a free parameter uh, through cosmic rays or through whatever, you can try to uh, uh, get or ask the question, what are the values of those different parameters that best fits the 20th uh, century? Um, and when you do that, you realize that uh, you need a climate sensitivity, which is, this is something I, I, I just briefly uh, flashed over, uh, of 0.9 plus or minus 0.3 degrees, uh, which is consistent with the other empirical data I showed you that gives you around one to one and a half degree increase. So when you try to, uh, uh, when you take this result, you, when you best fit what happened to the 20th century, um, and you leave the climate sensitivity as a free parameter, you find that about a half or two thirds of the warming is, a, is a natural because of the increase of the sun and only about, and the rest, uh, which is a third to a half because of uh, humans. Mr. Svensmark, <coughs> have your findings been discussed or even refuted by sciences uh, who work for the IPC? Ha have they been discussed publicly or even refuted? Have you uh, heard any uh, arguments uh, where you where they think you are wrong or you went into the wrong direction? Or has it been ignored? Yeah, uh, I mean, 
This mechanism is uh, discussed in the uh, last uh, IPCC report, and uh, they used a uh, author which is uh, spent more or less his whole uh, scientific career in criticizing what we are doing. So yes, uh, it has been discussed, and it has been said that uh, you know it's crazy, and uh, we can uh, ignore it. I mean, basically the. The, uh, the conclusion is that it's something that should be ignored. But it is uh, discussed. The thing is that uh, even though we have very good evidence to quantify the effect that the sun has, um, and uh, I think it, we first done it uh, around 2008, it was totally ignored by the IPCC. So instead of admitting, OK, maybe there is a mechanism we don't understand, but we see that the sun has a large effect, uh, what they say is that we don't understand the mechanism, even though we now think we almost have a complete picture. They say we don't understand it, and if you don't understand it, it must be wrong, and therefore we ignore the rest of the data that shows you that uh, the sun has a large effect. So this is basically the state, um, but um, maybe I'll quote um, Al Gore in his movie. He quoted uh, a, an economist called uh, Upton Sinclair who said, uh, you cannot convince people in something when their job depends on them not understanding it. So I think this basically summarizes why the IPCC is ignoring uh, the fact that the sun has a large effect because it completely invalidates the, the main arguments. Yeah, hello. Um, we heard, ich mache auf Deutsch, uh, wir haben gestern gehört, dass Susan Crockford aus Kanada, die Eisbärforscherin, wegen ihrer Forschungsarbeit und der darin enthaltenen falschen Ansichten gegangen wurde. Wir haben eben von Ihnen gehört oder in der Vorrede gehört, dass Sie weniger Forschungsmittel bekommen oder fast keine Forschungsmittel bekommen, aber Sie sind immerhin noch an der Universität. Wie ist die Situation in Dänemark und in Israel? Werden Sie attackiert? Oder können Sie äh, an Ihren Universitäten relativ äh, unbeeinträchtigt noch Ihre Forschung und Lehre machen? Well, it's a good question that uh, is difficult to answer, completely honest. Uh, um, it is difficult to uh, it's nearly impossible to get funding uh, to do our experimental work. Uh, so, uh, and, and that, I mean, I'm pretty convinced that it is because uh, this kind of work is not uh, really what you want to see a, a result on. Um, so, it is really problematic, but uh, I'm still having a job. Uh, so, that's, in that sense, it's, it's fine. And my colleagues, uh, you know, just around me are, uh, you know, we have a good uh, re relation. Uh, the uh, university, uh, well, I don't know how happy they are about what I'm doing, but uh, I'm, I'm still here. Um, in Israel, I think the... Uh the scientific uh, political situation is uh, much better. Uh, in Israel, we can really have uh, free debates. And um, I mean, not everyone agree, agrees with me, but I don't feel the same kind of feelings that uh, 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 colleagues of mine, maybe in Denmark or in other places in Europe, uh, feel. Uh, unfortunately, in Israel, we have real problems uh, to uh, worry about. So, uh, um, so maybe that's one of the reasons. Another thing is, but, but I mean, the bottom line is that in Israel, uh, I have no problem whatsoever. Uh, my university supports me. I can have, you know, open scientific uh, debates and, uh, and so on. Uh, it is true that, you know, getting uh, funding is generally hard uh, because, uh, you know, of the reviewing process and, and things like that. But um, maybe it's because we have a lot of sun that they don't mind me talking about the sun. Carsten Ax. Zu einmal eine Frage zum, zur Bindung des CO2 durch Kalk in den Meeren. Lithosphäre hatten Sie angesprochen. 
Da ist ja das Argument der Klimachanger, dass die Versauerung der Meere durch CO2 dazu führt, dass sich eben Kalk im Meer eher löst statt bindet. Können Sie dazu was sagen? Zweite Frage ist, Sie haben von dem Zyklus mit 60 Jahren zum Beispiel gesprochen. Weiß man, woher diese Zyklen kommen? Und die dritte Frage ist, wenn Wolken zu mehr Abkühlung führen, da ist ja auch das Argument der Klimachanger, die Luftfeuchtigkeit nimmt durch die Erwärmung zu, dadurch ist mehr Wasser in der Atmosphäre, es bilden sich mehr Wolken. Dann müsste doch aber, wenn mehr Wolken in der Atmosphäre sind, eine Abkühlung stattfinden. Das ist die letzte Frage. Um, okay, so the first, the answer to the first question is, uh, I mean, I suspect you, uh, a, you, may, you imply, oh, you, you want to talk about the over geological time scale, the past half billion years. Where, where is it? Um, on this, on this time scale, um, okay, so. Uh, When we first did the correlation between uh, the temperature and CO2 on geological timescales and found that there was no correlation uh, whatsoever, we could actually place an upper limit, which is uh, somewhat uh, below one degree increase per uh, CO2 doubling. But then uh, there were a lot of people that attacked uh, this work, and most of, most of these uh, attacks were, uh, were totally uh, meaningless or didn't have any teeth. But there was one argument which was uh, interesting and raised, um, and that is that... Uh, is something that the geological uh, or paleoclimatological community didn't uh, consider before is the fact that uh, ocean acidity, uh, which is affected by CO2, uh, affects the uh, oxygen isotope uh, ratio such that uh, the oxygen 18 is not only a, a proxy of, um, of temperature, but also uh, affected by the amount of CO2. And in order to get that there is no correlation between uh, CO2 and the temperature, it means that these two corrections have to uh, cancel each other, and therefore the lack of a correlation corresponds actually to a sensitivity of about one to one and a half uh, degrees. Um, I don't remember what was the second question. What was the second one? Um, Ah, 60 years. Uh, I didn't uh, particularly address uh, the 60 years or any other uh, time scales. Uh, I don't know uh, what are the origins of the uh, changes of uh, solar activity. I just, uh, you know, get them as a given. We can see what they were looking at uh, cosmogenic uh, isotopes and we can see whether they affect the climate uh, or, or not. Um, so I, I didn't address, we didn't address the 60 years. Um, and the last question was with regards to water vapor. Um, many of the arguments that uh, people raise uh, regarding the amount of water vapor and the effects of clouds uh, are irrelevant because in any climate model um, in, or in any change in the energy budget, whether it be CO2 or a cloud cover or solar irradiance or whatever, a large effect that you have is the fact that you, uh, say, warm the oceans and therefore you have more water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, so whether or not you see things like a change in the cloud cover or change in the water vapor uh, has to do more not with what was the driver of the change but how, what are the feedbacks in the system. And this goes back to, for example, uh, what Professor Scafetta mentioned with the, with the hotspots. Um, I think the, the lack of a hotspot is not a, an indicator of what the climate driver is, but the fact that the amount of water vapor change was actually smaller, that the feedbacks that you have in the systems are smaller than what, uh, uh, what the climate models uh, assume. So, vielen Dank, Henrik, vielen Dank, Neil. Also, ich, also mal eine Frage an Sie jetzt, ja? wenn man das jetzt gehört hat und nehmen wir mal an, man hat das alles verstanden noch dazu, ja? ja im Ernst, im Ernst, 
der Gedanke, dass diese Veranstaltung einen Polizeischutz bekommen hat und noch hat, ich muss sagen, das ist, ich kann, es ist pervers, dass wir das brauchen. Ja? 